South Africa, a country situated in the southern part of Africa. Somewhere along the lines, it does create the buffer, which is the actual border that keeps the European continent apart. It does make it little less likely to wonder why the country has a mixture of Caucasians and people of Negro descent as part of the formation of its population. This makes room for a wider mixture of people, a notoriety that has over the years earned its the name the Rainbow Nation. South Africa is a country of blacks, whites, Indians and other colored people or people of color. What a huge and lovely mix. What else could a country wish for after having a representation of the different peoples of the world as its citizens? It is one of the world's loveliest places with huge mineral deposits as well as great seasons including rain and winter and of course the lovely sun of summer. Its wide array of vegetation is also so lovely that from the distance the lovely yellow and mauve flower bushes depicts the world as God's best creation. Added to all this, it depicts wildlife which is almost second to none. The country has an abundance of what zoologists term the disappearing species of animals and birds. The country also plays host to what it continually and proudly calls Africa's Big Five, including the lion, the leopard and of course the elephant. South Africa is just splendid. But perhaps of all the good reasons for which South Africa has over the years stood tall, there is one more reason for which the name of that country was heard all over the world. It was for the practice of an attitude or perhaps system called apartheid. It was one in which one race felt superior to another in every aspect of life. How many burger you believe in apartheid as a way of life? Yes, I do. Why? In South Africa. Why is that, sir? Uh, because the race which is in uh, a lesser state of development is by far in the majority here. And numerically, of course, they are much stronger. And because also I believe that it is according to God's will that the white race which is in the majority in this country should be preserved. And also everything we have done in the last 300 years and built up in the church and in the state should be preserved and not be swallowed up by an, I wouldn't say inferior race, because it, I don't believe it is an inferior race, but a lesser a, a, a race which is in a lesser state of development. Let us understand that here in South Africa, and in fact in the whole of Africa, we are dealing with a national question. And Africa is not very peculiar in this respect. Nearly every country has had its, na its national problem. And they are always solved by the people according to the, the needs of the majority of the people in the particular countries concerned. I have, at the present moment, we don't even have the right to stop. Well, the white people in South Africa some time ago practiced an act that had been practiced in Europe and the United States a long time ago. It's made a black person inferior to a white person. Remember Rosa Parks, the black American seamstress who refused to give her bus seat to a white passenger? Well, let me have those front seats. Y'all better make it light on yourselves and let me have those seats. Are you gonna move? No. If you don't give me that seat, I'm gonna have you arrested. You may do that. Jesus. 
Driver James Blake. Listen, I got a, I got a colored woman on my bus in violation of the law. Did you want her, Jim? Did you like me? Yes, sir, I warned her. Well, then you just do it. You got to exercise your powers and put her off. All right, man, I'm going to need police backup. Grandpa, I think I hate white people. Only thing you need to remember is that you're as good as anybody else. White, black, or green with stripes. Don't we ever be afraid of what can happen to you if you're fighting for what's right. As long as you keep that with you. He to be a word for other people. section. I needed that seat and she wouldn't move. I want her arrested. Why won't you stand up? Why do you all push us around? Will you listen to that? The law is the law. Lady, you're under arrest. She was subsequently arrested for sitting on the wrong part of the bus. Her only issue was her skin pigment. Being black, she was supposed to be seated on the back parts of a public transport. That was the rule. It was a bad rule, but it was so. Rosa Parks, follow me. I need to use the telephone. It was an act that sparked the Montgomery bus boycott and the march on Washington, led by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. It witnessed the beginning of the end of racism or racial discrimination in the United States. I would simply like to say that I think this has been one of the great days of America. And I think this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity ever held in the United States. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Well, after this was over and done with, on the American and European soils, it was still being practiced somewhere in Africa. In South Africa, white supremacy ran supreme. Even children and schools were not spared. We have made it very clear in our policy that uh, South Africa is a country, a country of many races. There is room for all the various races in this country. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. Educated black people like Nelson Mandela, who opposed that system, were quickly hunted out, arrested, and charged with treason, and locked away on an island far away from the mainland. I have fought against white domination 
and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the idea of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunity. It is an idea which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it is an idea for which I am prepared to die. And then the biggest occurrence happened that made headlines all around the world. Little secondary school children in the first and second grades in a school called Orlando High in Orlando, a place in Soweto, went on the rampage in defiance against school authorities who had refused to budge after parents and children continually called on them to recoil from their posture on the introduction of a subject called Afrikaans. It was a mixture of Germanic and Dutch languages, and it was so difficult that it was preventing these children from passing their matriculation examinations for graduation into colleges and universities. Matters came to a head on 16th June 1976. The children of Orlando High staged a protest against their authorities, and the police were called in. They rolled in. It resulted in a massacre. Little school children were trapped in a hail of bullets. The first to die that morning was 13 years old Hector Peterson, who was caught by a stray bullet as he stood in front of his school, Orlando High School. That same day, News of the World carried the news of the Soweto Massacre, and that was the name of the city in South Africa. It was heard alone. <laughs> South Africa. This is Soweto and as you can hear from the background you're listening to songs by Malatheni and the Mahotelo Queens. And for a very long time I am sure uh, you have been hearing some of these songs. Songs uh, that were made famous during the struggles in South Africa. On my left is Orlando, a very big township here in Soweto, whilst on my right is Midlands, where you have some of the most beautiful areas that have still remained almost untouched. From where I talk to you is Dubai. Dubai as in the name Lucky Dubai. And just behind me is a pharmacy called Lucky. But don't get it wrong. It doesn't belong to Lucky Dubai, nor is this the hometown of Lucky Dubai. Being lucky and Dubai are quite common words here in South Africa. But for the next moments, we shall be looking around Soweto, this wonderful place that made history in 1976. For the next few minutes, let's tour. Let's tour this beautiful place called Soweto. It is a black township with wonderful places that you may want to see. And after all, you also realize that it was not Serafina that could tell the best stories of what happened here in 1976. It takes Sierra Leone to come here to South Africa and to Soweto to see what this beautiful township is like. Let's tour.
Here are we in Orlando West, a place that is uh, well known because uh, it is a place where Nelson Mandela used to live every year or perhaps every month or perhaps every week or perhaps every day. Many people come here to this place where Mandela used to be because they want to view where such a big man in the world, such a name that would go to every corner in this world, that is the name of Nelson Mandela started. It started like any other African boy, with humility, almost in loneliness, almost in obscurity. But later on, it became the name that would go to every corner. This is Nelson Mandela's former residence. This was where the man that would make history used to live, in great humility. And if you get into uh, this place, you will realize that Big endings usually have very small beginnings. It is a monument now where people come day in, day out to ensure that they get a glimpse of what that big name, well, used to be in those very early beginnings. Number 8115 Villa Gaza Street, Orlando West. This is the residence of Nelson Mandela. And uh, there are many things about this place that many people may want to know. In fact, on the night after his formal release from prison, it was to this place that Winnie Madikizela Mandela, that is the former wife of Nelson Mandela, came with Nelson 27 years after he had been in prison. It was a different place altogether. It was quite different from Ruben Island, where he had been for 27 years. And there were several remarks that uh, were made by he himself, Nelson Mandela. Uh, one of uh, such was that he had said this to other people on the night that it happened. He said, that night I returned with Winnie to number 8115 in Orlando West. It was only then that I knew in my heart that I had left prison. For me, number 8115 was the center point of my world. The place marked with an X in my mental geography. This is a quote by Nelson Mandela in his book, Long Walk to Freedom, on his return to number 8115 Orlando West after his release from 27 years of imprisonment on 11th February 1990. Well, as you can see, there are many people here who are also touring this very historic place, the place where Nelson Mandela, the first black president of South Africa, a name known everywhere in the world, used to live in such humility. As you can see, it is marked there, Mandela House. But as a matter of fact, you can see the house from this point. It's such a small house. It is such a very small house. Such a small house. Humble garden. And if you look through these bars, you can see that there could be time to relax a little at the back of the house. I am definitely sure these little sophistications that have been added weren't there and we didn't have been there in those days when apartheid reigned. In those days, prior to those 27 long years spent in Robben Island where Nelson Mandela was incarcerated because of his total objection to the system that was in the offing at the moment, the apartheid system, which kept one race as minority and the other superiority and dominance over the other. It shouldn't happen, they say. Every race is the same. No one, no one must be able to throw his weight over the others. Keep watching SLBC. Interesting, just next door is Mandela's family restaurant. And those who have been talking about this, they say this restaurant is owned by not only the Mandela family, but chiefly by Nelson Mandela's former wife, the one to whom he remarked about being at number 8115, that is on the streets, Winnie Madikazela Mandela. She is the big woman in charge of this restaurant, the Mandela family restaurant. Hello, how are you? Now, what do you have here today? Now, d does Winnie come here all the time? Oh, yes. Mrs. Mandela, she hardly comes. How about the rest of the Mandela family? Do they eat here? Sometimes. And then when they're usually here, you're very nice to them. 
Yeah. Okay, so if I tell you that I'm one of the family, would you agree and would you serve me well? Uh, yeah. I'm one of your bosses, right? <laughs> no, but I'm not. I'm far away from Sierra Leone, but I'm very happy to be in the Mandela family restaurant. I must remind you that this is still the precincts of Orlando, but they call this Villa Casa Street Precinct. Now, it's interesting. It was around this area that in 1976, those children went wayward. It was around this area that they said they were going to take the law into their own hands and they were going to demand what they deserved and they were going to get what they desired. This is Villa Casa Street. And if you just come here, there is something quite interesting about this place. It says, welcome to Villa Casa Street Heritage Trail. This trail invites you to experience one of Soweto's best known neighborhoods named after Dr. Benedict Wallet Villacase, a former African scholar and celebrated for having the only street in the world to house two Nobel laureate winners, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. The township was also the epicenter of the Soweto uprising in 1976, a dramatic turning point in the struggle against apartheid. It is worth reflecting that it would have been impossible to do the same work during apartheid. Visitors to black townships had to apply to the location superintendent for a permit to enter. During the Soweto uprising in 1976 and the state emergency in 1986, menacing military vehicles rumbled through the township streets day and night. Sowetans were not allowed outdoors between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. Journalists that, like myself, were barred from entering Soweto. It was only after 1990, with the release of Nelson Mandela and the unbanning of the political organizations, that residents and outsiders could move freely around townships like Soweto. The Villa Casa Street Heritage Trail is a project of Johannesburg Development Agency in collaboration with the city of Joburg and the Hector Peterson Museum. This trail has been conceived with the active involvement of neighborhood organizations and residents. Orlando West is where several important personalities who shaped South Africa's history have lived. It is also just an ordinary neighborhood nurturing generations of Soweto residents. This trail will give you a taste of life in Soweto, both past and present. It was done, this write-up, by Leal Bethlehem GDA in 2010. But as it is just said here, this trail will give you a taste of life in Soweto, both past and present. Let's see whether it is true or not. They've just asked me to read something else. It says, as you walk through Villa Casa Street Princings, illustrated signs will direct you to important houses and landmarks. That is what we're set to say. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's go. Um, what we're finding now, actually, is the point where Hector Peterson, well, you will ask whether that's a South African because the name itself is sounding a little foreign, but he was a mixed race boy who attended school with fellow mixed race and even black children. And he was part of the 1976 uprising here in Soweto. It was right down there, down the road, that Hector Peterson was shot dead on that day, 16th June 1976, when they took to the streets against the killer language Africans. We're going to locate the spot now where Hector Peterson lay bleeding as a man rushed him to hospital and his sister in the trail, a picture that made world headlines. Uh, in Orlando West and this is Villa Gaza Street. We've just reached uh, almost at an intersection of Villa Gaza Street. But I must tell you that this was the place that history was made in 1976. This was the school that made headlines. It was this school that decided to lead the uprising in 1976. It was this school that came out to say enough was enough and that they weren't going to be taught in Afrikaans because it was the killer subject. Now, um, in memory of that incident in 1976, this memorial was installed, and here it reads, the memorial, or this memorial was created in 2000 during the building of the Hector Peterson Museum. The architects installed the wall on this corner 
as this was believed to be the spot where the stray bullet killed Hector Peterson. His sister, Antoinette, who we'll see up there later, uh, as well as other eyewitnesses accounts now helps us to understand that Hector was probably hit further up Moema Street towards the Hector Peterson Memorial, which is right up there. The placement of this wall signals difficulty of memorializing historical events, especially if they happened in situations of violence. Witnesses to such events are often traumatized and confused. In the first days of the uprising, there were many conflicting stories of what happened and several mistakes were made in newspaper reports. Over the last decades, many people have shared their memories of this time and a more accurate version of the chronology of the uprising has emerged. But differences and contradictions still exist. The police and the students still tell very different stories about who was responsible for the first acts of violence. Other issues such as pinpointing the exact place where Hector Peterson was shot are also still being discussed. The placement of this memorial, it is said here, is an excellent example of the difficulty of history and heritage making. The difficulty is recognized by the staff of the Hector Peterson Memorial who see the presentation of the story of June 16th as an ongoing process and have committed themselves to being open to different interpretations of the day. Perhaps the only real certainty is that the generations of 1976, those defiant and courageous youths who we are determined to change the world, will continue to tell their stories and will add to and alter their historical record. Their own memories of the uprising will remain forever embedded in their minds. Be that as it may, there is this stop close to the school where Hector Peterson attended. So whether he was shot here or not, it is believed that it was around here that he could have been shot. This 13-year-old boy was shot at a time when there was confusion. The sister said it must have happened somewhere up there where his memorial now stands. Others say it must have happened here. So whilst the police of those days who still remain, who still tell stories, who are still alive to witness all these happenings, continue to tell stories that may be conflicting, and the family telling stories that also may be conflicting, it is true that in a situation of chaos, different things may happen and people's understanding of what's going on amidst the haste, the hurry, the chaos, and the anomaly would be different. But amongst all these things, one thing remains important. How could police officers come out with guns against students or rather pupils whose only weapons were students? They rolled out their tanks to the street and you can see that they were not even handed. In fact, they were high handed in their dealing with the situation. Those stones and those tanks are not comparable and could not in any way be juxtaposed. Today, there is a memorializing of 13-year-old Hector Peterson. It reads here, Hector Zole Peterson, 13-year-old schoolboy, was shot and died at this corner during a clash between the police and students in the uprising against Africans, a medium of instruction. Africans, that subject that the children did not like. Let's uh, just come over this point. School is right now in session, but um, you can see that uh, if we can just put it through the bars, this is uh, Orlando West High School, uh, PC Training Business College. Well, it also adds your gateway to better life. It was that gateway to better life that uh, those pupils, the pupils of those days, actually wanted. Look at those children. Today they sit in comfort because apartheid is ended and they could be taught in a language that they are comfortable with. Uh, let me talk to you a minute. Tell me your name. My name is Gosun Peter Stewart. You are not of Orlando High School? I'm not of Orlando High School. But what are you doing here right now? Yeah, we are here, you see, F4K, you see, because they are respectful, you see. <laughs> yes. And now, uh, if you have a respectful girl, even your parents will respect you because you are marrying someone who is respectful to us there. But you are in school and they are in school, so yes. uh, getting married is out of the question now. But what, what, what is your opinion of this school? This school that's made history? Oh, uh, this school has made history, you know, uh, because of, of the respect of the heroes that came out of this school that made Soweto to be what it is today. Uh, we live in, in, a, in a free Soweto, okay, should I say free world? Because now in Soweto we get to do things that they couldn't do then. 
you see so now it's, it's free and we thank this school the heroes from this school to stand for us you know in the past for us to now you know be free to do anything but not anything as in disrespectful you get me yes, sir. thank you very much <laughs> Hello, how are you? How is school? You having a good time? We love this school. It's a good school, no? You enjoying time here? Okay, do they still teach Africans? Do they teach Africans? You always talk English. Okay, have a good day. All right, bye. Okay, that's it. Nice children enjoying school. And uh, as a matter of fact, they had to ask again when I talk, spoke about Africans because as a matter of fact, it is a thing of the past to the extent that even the word is not easily recognized in a school setting. In short, it is not taught in schools. That's it, we're here at the Vilakazi precinct. This is the area that has been dedicated to Hector Peterson. This is his memorial museum. Everything around here is to depict 16th June 1976. That year that those pupils went on the rampage demanding what they desired and deserved. Hector was killed and so were other children. Hector was 13 and he became a symbol of the uprising. A young, fearless little boy who knew what was right for him and who decided to join the bigger boys and girls to demand from the authorities that Afrikaans was not a language that would give them the job they would like to be in upon completion of school. That over there is a whole museum that symbolizes what happened in 1976. Pictures of those pupils with placards saying down with Africans, to hell with Africans, Africans is a killer. All those children who were on the streets on that day have got their pictures in there. And all these are memorabilia of what happened on that day. Look at this one. It has up there 16th June 1976 in memory of Hector Peterson and all other young heroes and heroines of our struggle who lay down their lives for freedom, peace and democracy. And it is said here, it was unveiled by Dr. Nelson Rulihahla Mandela on 16th June 1992 president of the ANC. At the time he was not president of the country yet when he unveiled this one. It was erected by ANC Youth League, that is the African National Congress, which is the party to which he belonged and the party that is still in church here in South Africa. As you can see there are a good number of visitors to this museum every day because the history of South Africa is rich and the history of South Africa is being told all over the world. Some people will decide to come and see after hearing so much about what is taking place in South Africa. And now, this is the picture that many newspapers in the world carried in 1976 in the aftermath of the Soweto uprising and Soweto massacre. This is Hector Peterson. It is said that at, the, at this point, he had still not been dead. He was still alive and carried by this unknown man when this happened. This was his 14-year-old sister who told the story. They were running to hospital. The sad thing is, Hector died not long after. And as you can see, water still runs 
It is said that the water that continues to run around here is to symbolize the flowing blood of those children who were killed in 1976. This is to symbolize the flowing blood. But the question to be asked is, why is it not red? Well, because the blood ran and ran out and now it's white. The era of apartheid and the shedding of blood is over. As you know, Soweto is a place of many, many parts. This is Diplo, and as you can see, it's a beautiful scenery above the rest of Soweto. It is made up of everything, from biggest roads with eight lanes, to smaller roads with just two lanes, from biggest mansions to smaller houses, from the biggest stadiums to small little fields, from the nicest of cars, I mean the most recently manufactured, to the oldest that could be. So Waito is just a place of different kinds of people. Well, that is the reason why many people refer to it as the Rainbow Nation. It is something to be expected because it is where the world meets. This is South Africa, a country of several parts. And this is a way to where history was made from the 1960s to when Nelson Mandela became the first black president of South Africa. Never, never, and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another. This is Soweto, where the black people have continued to live, but these days in freedom and in unity, in the modesty that they are always known, but a child that is born anywhere here in Soweto or any other black ship can become president because it is an even country these days. It is one country with the same people with equal opportunities. It depends how you can play your role.